Hi there, I'm Joe Tai, and today I am going to add to your vocabulary. I'm going to share with you some words that can help you achieve your goals and possibly even change your life in a positive way. But first, let's look at this picture. I'm sure you've seen some version of this meme on the internet. Tabby Cat looks in the mirror and sees the lion looking back. Now, that image raises some really good questions, doesn't it? Like this. Who could you be and what goals would you achieve if you didn't let fear stop you from being the person you're meant to be, from doing the work that you're meant to do? If you did a better job of living what your values really are, who could you be? What could you achieve? Now, for most of us, the reality is more like this. We are the lion. We were born with this incredible potential and power. And over life, we run into teachers and parents and bosses and schoolyard bullies and bullies in the break room. And we lose that vision of who we once were. We lose those goals that we once had. We look in the mirror and we pretend to be the tabby cat. And we see that looking back. Now, who could you be and what could you achieve if you could reverse that? If you could go back to seeing that lion in the mirror that you once were. But it's not enough just to see that image of who you could be. You have to be willing to do the work. And the work begins with the words you use. Because you see, words matter. The words we use matter. The way we use those words matter. Not just in how we affect other people, but in how we affect ourselves. Especially the words you use when you talk to yourself. Those words are the hammer and the chisel that you carved the statue of you. And every time you're talking to somebody else, remember, you are also talking to yourself. When you put yourself down talking to somebody else, you're talking to yourself too. Jeffrey Schwartz is one of the pioneers of neuroplasticity, brain plasticity. That is the ability of the human mind to reconfigure itself physically in response to not only outside stimuli and outside events, but in response to directed mental effort, as he wrote in his book, The Mind and the Brain. See, the words that you use can have a physiological impact on the hard wiring of your brain. That's why it's so important to be cautious and judicious and deliberate and conscientious about the words that you use. And let me give you a very real world, very recent example. I have been working on this recording for quite a while now, and I finally got it all right. Went through the whole thing, and it did not record for some reason. Now, my first reaction was to throw something against the wall, to throw a temper tantrum. But for years now, I have been reminding myself of the pickle pledge that I will turn every complaint, and I had a complaint, into either a blessing or a constructive suggestion. So rather than throwing something against the wall, I immediately went to this new default to find a blessing. Yeah, at least it wasn't a live audience sitting there waiting for me to for 45 minutes and not hearing something. And a constructive suggestion. As I went through it, I was thinking, you know, this could be a little bit better. So I went back through and I've made some editing changes in the presentation, which I hope will be better. And I'm hoping is now recording. And here's the problem for most of us. I often give presentations for large groups and I often use live polling and ask questions. And so one of the questions I ask has to do with negative self-talk. And I have had in various audiences thousands of people respond to this question about negative self-talk and seven out of 10, I mean, we're talking thousands of people, seven out of 10 tell me that they have a constant struggle with negative self-talk. I do too. And I'm pretty sure on at least your worst days, you do as well. And let's talk about how you use those words and how they can affect your outlook on life and what you see when you look in your mirror. And let's take one word in particular, hope. I love hope. Hope is such an amazing thing. It's such an, an incredible power. We've, we must never lose a sacred hope. 
I feel so strongly about it that when I wrote the book, The Healing Tree, I actually wrote about the Hope Diamond, the most precious diamond in the world, because there's no such thing as false hope. But that word used inappropriately can be so disempowering. I hope my business won't fail. I hope I'll pass the certification test. Gee, I hope my girlfriend's parents will like me. When you use that incredible word hope in that disempowering way, it's like you take the light out of the picture. You suck the wind out of the sails. The sunflower dies. What if you replace that word hope with more empowering words? I, I'm not hoping. I am determined my business will succeed. I'm confident that I will pass the certification test. I know my girlfriend's parents will like me because I will like them first. See, when you replace hope, which is a wonderful thing, with a more powerful set of words like determination or confidence or knowledge, you don't just affect the people around you, you affect yourself. You affect the way you're going to approach a problem. Words matter. The way you use words matters. When you use power words like determination or confidence, you, you put light back into the picture. You, you help the sunflower grow. You put wind into the sails. And so I want to share with you five empowering new words that can help you achieve your goals. And if you use them well, help you change your life in a positive way. Now, you have never heard these words before. They are not in the dictionary, at least not yet, because I made them up. So don't go, go look for them there. Write them down now so that you'll have some record of them. And the first new word I want to share with you is stretch. Now, stretch is the marriage of two words, stretch and reach. It means to stretch yourself outside of your comfort zone so that you can expand your reach by achieving bigger goals and making a bigger difference in your corner of the world. And you know, you may have seen this image on the internet. It's a very well-known image about the comfort zone. You know, we all start out in our comfort zone, feeling safe and in control, but that's actually not a very comfortable place to be. If nobody ever left the comfort zone, we would still be out in the woods hunting and gathering. There would be no innovators, no inventors, no entrepreneurs, no educators, if nobody was ever willing to get outside of that comfort zone and grow. So what we do is we set a goal. We get out of our comfort zone and we, we confront anxiety, we confront fear. Our lack of self-confidence causes us to find excuses to worry too much about what other people think of us. And we have a choice to make then, don't we? We can either retreat back into the comfort zone and turn on the TV set, or we can keep pushing through that fear zone and deal with the challenges that we face. We can learn new skills. We can grow our comfort zone. And as we do that, we start to live bigger dreams. We start to set new goals. We start to achieve our objectives. We start to, we start to get comfortable out there. And then what happens, of course, is we circle back. We don't just stay in that one spot because we are programmed to want to grow and achieve more. We have to cycle back and go through that fear zone and that learning zone again. It's a lifelong cycle. And I love this question. When was the last time you did something for the first time? That is how you escape the confines, the bars of your comfort zone, by doing things you haven't done before, by learning new things, by setting bigger goals. This is a sign I have in my office, and it says, the one big yes requires a lot of little no's. You want to write a book? You don't have four and a half hours a day to watch television, which is what the average American does, according to A.C. Nielsen. You want to start a business? You do not have enough money to go shopping therapy every time you get bored or depressed. If you want to say yes to the one big thing, you have to say no to a lot of the little things. And unfortunately, most of us don't do that. Again, back to my live polling with thousands of people in lots of different audiences. Most of us don't even spend one hour a day working on what we say is our primary goal. In fact, for many people, it's not even a number of minutes a day. 
And so here's how you can overcome that problem. Make two lists. The first list, of course, is your to-do list. I don't know how anybody can get through a day without a to-do list. In fact, it's a motivator, isn't it? Have you ever done something that wasn't on your list and written it down so you could check it off? I know I do. The second list is much smaller, much shorter. It's your big ticket item list. It's the things that really matter to you personally. This is not a bucket list. These are not things that someday, maybe when you're old and tired and, and done with all your real work that you're going to finally get around to. No, these are things that matter to you right now. Applying to business school, getting an MBA, writing a book, starting a business, things that are important to you now, but they're your big ticket items. So when you complete your to-do list, make sure that on that list, there is at least one thing that is not for somebody else. It's for you to achieve that one big yes, that one goal that's on your big ticket item list. Circle it in red. But if you're like me and most other people, it's going to be at the bottom of your list and you will not never get to it because the end of the days come and you still have urgent things that you have to do. So here's what you do. Move it to the top of your list and make it your number one priority that day. Your first 30 minutes, you're going to spend working on your business school application, working on a chapter for your book, working on something to help you achieve your one big yes. It's not somebody else's big yes that you're working on. This is your own personal one big yes. See, the difference between wishful thinking and positive thinking is getting that one big yes done. Wishful thinking is hoping for something and waiting for someone else to do it for you. And of course, that almost never happens. Positive thinking is expecting something and then doing the work to make it happen. That is how you achieve your one big yes. That is how you stretch yourself by stretching yourself out of your comfort zone and expanding your reach in the world. But you're going to run into resistance. And so you need to have my new word, resistance, anticipating resistance and preparing yourself to effectively deal with it. Steve Pressfield wrote the indispensable book, The War of Art. And in that book, he said, most of us have two lives, the life we live, you know, our everyday job, going to work, and the unlived life within us, the author, the artist, the entrepreneur, the teacher that we've never become. And we haven't become that because between those two lives, he says, stands resistance. He defines resistance as that negative inner force that prevents us from doing our work, prevents us from creating ourselves, our lives, the life we would live if it weren't for all of those barriers. And he says, the more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. If you truly want to write a book, you're going to have a lot of resistance. If you truly want to start a business, there will be a lot of fear, fear of rejection, fear of failure. That is natural. You can't wait for the fear to go away. You have to act in the face of that fear. And Steve says to yield to resistance deforms our spirit. It stunts us. It makes us less than we are and who we were meant to be, born to be. You have to face up to that resistance and act in the face of it. And Steve's formula in the book, The War of Art, is very simple, turn pro. And he doesn't necessarily mean you join some exalted profession or even that you get paid for it. It means that every day you pick up your lunch pail, you put on your hard hat, and you go do your work. You complete the application for graduate school. You write another page in your book. You make another call to start your business. And he starts his day. And now as a result of that book, I start my day with a simple ritual that gets you in the mindset. It's a picture of my home office. And when I come down to write or to record something, I have that ugly rock and it represents resistance. And I wrap it with a wristband that says determination. It's Wednesday's promise 
from the self-empowerment pledge, I will do the things I'm afraid to do, but which I know should be done. And on this morning, I know I need to close that door and sit down and do my work. So I turn up the hourglass and I will not leave this room until the sand in that glass has gone all the way through. I light my cup of joe candle that my friend Michelle gave me to inspire me with that light. And then I give my gong a little whack to remind me that it's time to start, time to start working. And see, I've become now like Pavlov's dog. When the hourglass is turned, the wristband is on, the candle is lit, and the gong has been gonged, it's time for me to sit down and do my work. And I don't get up until the hourglass has passed through. And then I hit the gong again. And it's time now for me to move on to something else, maybe after having a cup of coffee. And so I suggest to you that you can combat resistance, you can create pre-existence by setting up your own little rituals and then sitting down and doing your work. But when you do that, you will inevitably run into brick walls. And that's why you need prosilience. Word number three, prosilience is prospective resilience. See, resilience is so important, especially after the kind of year we've just had. But resilience is always after the fact. You get down after you have, you get back up after you have fallen down. You rebuild after things have been torn down. You open a new door after the old door has closed. It's after the fact. Prosilience is before the fact. It is boarding up the windows before the hurricane comes. It is preparing yourself in advance for the fact that bad things do happen. Harold Kushner's famous book did not say if bad things happen to good people. It is when. They are inevitably going to happen to all of us. And if you have prepared yourself emotionally, physically, spiritually for the fact that it will happen, and when it does happen, you will not allow yourself to be a victim you will plow through it much more effectively. Joseph Campbell, in his famous book about the hero's journey, he said, that's all of our journey. We all run into an ordeal somewhere in life. That is the story of the hero, the story of life. Every story throughout history, from Beowulf and the Odyssey, through Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings, is the story of the everyday hero. When you think of the people we most admire, that is what we remember. We remember them and their ordeal. We remember Washington at Valley Forge and crossing the ice on the Delaware River on Christmas Eve. We remember Florence Nightingale facing the horrors of the Scutari Barrack Hospital in that first dreadful winter during the Crimean War. We remember Martin Luther King behind bars in the Birmingham jail, writing his famous letter, challenging views on segregation. We all run into brick walls. And the challenge is, how do we face those brick walls, overcome the, the barriers? Brandy Posh, in his beautiful little book, The Last Lecture, said, brick walls are not there to stop you. They are there to make you prove how much you want something. And preparing yourself ahead of time to be resilient in the face of those challenges with prosilience will give you the strength to show the world how much you really want something. See, Saturday's or Friday's promise in the self empowerment pledge is about resilience. And it really is more about prosilience. It says, I will face rejection and failure with courage, awareness, and perseverance making these experiences the platform for future acceptance and success. See, here's how I view it. Rejection is like the red badge of courage. The only people who ever get rejected are the people who have the courage to ask. Failure is like the Medal of Honor. The only people who ever fail are the people who have the courage to try. And so embed those words. I will face rejection. I won't I won't fail to ask because I'm afraid of rejection. I will have the courage to ask, even though I might get rejected. I will have the courage to try, even though I might fail. 
That is how you earn that Medal of Honor, that red badge of courage. And it begins with the words that you use to talk to yourself, the way you convince yourself that you're going to have the courage and the perseverance that you need. But of course, anything you want to achieve, you can't do by yourself. And the bigger your OBY, your one big yes, your big goal, the more help you're going to need. So you need the Ned Log rule, another one I made up. We all know the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is a, a fundamental teaching in virtually every religious and spiritual tradition. Ned Log is the word golden spelled backwards. And the Ned Log rule is the golden rule in reverse. Here's what it means. Anything you would be willing to do for somebody else if they asked you, the golden rule, be willing to ask for that same help when you need it. Something that doesn't come easily to many of us in our Lone Ranger society where we're afraid to ask other people for help. But the problem is you cannot pour out of an empty pitcher. And if all you're doing is the golden rule, helping and helping and serving and serving and giving and giving, but you never take the time to refill your own pitcher, you never ask for the time you need, the help you need, the finances you need, your pitcher ends up becoming empty. If you need a hug, ask for the hug. And what happens when one person helps, two people always end up being helped. It, one person can't give a hug, <laughs> at least not a hug that has much meaning. You have to be willing to ask for the help you need. And when you do, you're actually helping the person that you've asked because people like to help. And so let's get to my last word that can be a life changer, and that is the word Dianarap. And again, it's not yet in the dictionary. Dianarap is the word paranoid spelled backwards. See, the paranoid person thinks that everybody's out to get them. There's a knock on the door and they immediately assume the worst. The Diana rap thinks the world's out to help them. There's a knock on the door and their first thought is, whoa, maybe it's a pizza. Diana raps have this sneaky suspicion that the universe is conspiring to help them be happy, conspiring to help them succeed in achieving their goals, whatever happens. The, the Diana rap sees the four-leaf clover, the lucky horseshoe, the lucky rabbit's foot in everything they do. And they assume that other people like them. They assume that they want you to succeed. And even if they say no, they're acting in good faith. What they're really saying is not no. What they're really saying is not yet. You have to try and ask in a different way. You have to do something else first. The, the answer is eventually gonna be yes, you're just not there yet. That is the Diana rap code. See, here's the deal. You tend to get what you expect. And there's a lot of scientific evidence backing that up. You tend to get what you expect out of life, out of other people, out of yourself. So why not expect the best? Why not be a Diana rap instead of being paranoid? Why not look at the world through rose colored glasses? Look at your own future through rose-colored binoculars because you tend to get what you expect. So expect rosiness. What's stopping you? What's stopping you from achieving your goals? What's stopping you from being the person you know you want to be, the person you're meant to be? And I want to wrap up with words that I didn't make up, but they're words that are so powerful. It's the most important three words in my book, The Florence Prescription. Proceed until apprehended. You don't need a management title to be a leader. All you need is to be emotionally positive and self-empowered and fully engaged. Proceed until apprehended. You don't need somebody else's permission to become the person you're meant to be. You do not need anybody else's approval to achieve the goals that are important to you. All you need is to proceed until apprehended. And if you proceed fast enough, by the time anybody figures out what you're doing, it's going to be too late for them to try to apprehend you. Become the lion in your mirror. Become your best self. Achieve your most important goals by changing the words you use to describe yourself, to describe your surroundings, to describe the people around you, to describe the world around you. 
Use powerful words. Stop hoping and start being determined and being confident and being knowledgeable. And you will become that lion in your mirror. You will achieve the goals that are most important to you. I'm Joe Ty, and this is me the last time I did something for the first time. I would love to hear from you. What are you achieving for the first time? You can reach me at joe at valuescoach.com or on LinkedIn. I don't do the other social medias, but LinkedIn, I'm at Joe Ty. Or give us a call at the Values Coach office at 319-624-3889. And I will look forward to hearing what you are accomplishing when you do new things for the first time. We'll see you later.